Welcome to the Run for God Run Club, where you will find God in a runner's space. Welcome to the Run for God Run Club. This is your one stop each week to be motivated and inspired to get off your couch and onto the running trail where you can in turn inspire others to do the same. Let's learn, laugh, and leap into running together, giving God the glory for what we are able to do in His name. Amen. I am your running host, Dean Thompson. Today, we're going to ask the age old question, Why did the chicken cross the road? (laughs) And then I'm going to share a trick that I discovered way back in my college days. And that trick actually changed my life. And maybe it'll give you some ideas on some things that can change your life. And joining me, of course, to discuss those things and a whole lot more is Run for God founder Mitchell Holland. Thanks for having me, Dean. I think we both have baritone voices now. Yeah. You, you've had it for a few weeks, and yeah. now I think I've got it. And welcome to the South, where yeah. it's it's going to be eighty five degrees this week, and we're we're one day out of February. I mean, it's crazy. And then I saw where was it San Bernardino, California. Actually, some of our run club members I, I know. Um, in Casper, Wyoming, we've yeah. got some run club members out there. Feet and feet of snow. Yeah, and we've got eighty-five degrees today. We don't know what that's like. It's, uh, it's yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. I'm glad. I'm glad we're where we are. But the pollen is kicking into high gear, and it's just now March, and it doesn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'm still thinking about last week's podcast. I Me think that too. one was pretty impactful to you it and I was. both. It was. It was. You could. I think you could tell just by the look on our faces as we were as we were talking through it. Yeah. And uh, what a what a cool story it was for yeah. sure. For sure, somebody called me Bubba this week. I, I did. Yeah. I called you Bubba. <laughs> you've been uh, you've been helping me on some of these track workouts, and yeah, it's uh, it, we need to hear more about about this Bubba guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, he says he doesn't want to be the focus. So, for what it's worth, his email back to me was, "Yes, you can use my words, but I just don't want to be the focus." And so uh, it's sorry, Bubba. You, yeah, you, <laughs> so hard not. You've to. been the focus around here for a little while. Yeah, so. yeah, but yeah. Cool guy. Yep. All right. Let's talk about this week's sponsor before we get started. Again, if you are a business out there and you want to support what we do here at Run for God, uh, send us an email. You can send it to runlanehollis at gmail dot com. We'll get you all the information on how you can support what we do and at the same time us support what you do but this week's sponsor is hanks carpet and flooring uh hanks carpet and flooring is your one-stop shop for all your flooring needs hank stocks a huge selection of name brand flooring carpet luxury vinyl plank waterproof flooring and the exclusive lola pate area rug collection voted north georgia's best of the best for eight straight years and people's choice winner for the past two great flooring great prices why shop anywhere else? Visit Hank's Carpet and Flooring, their giant showroom, or at hankscarpet.com for red hot deals. And uh, again, thank you to Hank and the whole crew over there. Um, we can't do what we do without our sponsors, so we're we're grateful for everyone that supports what we do. Absolutely. And this past week, this was uh, a post off of Facebook um, from Kelly Harmon Miller. Now, it's a very simple post. It is uh, first post-marathon run today, just one mile, but boy, did I need it. Didn't realize how much I rely on the running now for my overall feeling of well-being. So glad to be back at it. Just a really short, simple post that says so much, it right? It does, yeah. I mean, it's great to see that people are taking time off. That's We need that every now and then. We do. We do. And she's doing that. Um, you know, I didn't take any time off after the marathon. And the 5K that I just ran yeah. um, showed that I didn't take any time off. <laughs> now, <laughs> remind me again what that 5K was. It was some kind of national championship. It, it was a 5K road championships okay. for Masters. And it was in Atlanta? It was in Atlanta. And, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. You did pretty well at it, though, didn't you? I finished second in my age group. But I will say this. My age group is 55 to 59. Mm-hmm. And I would have finished fourth in the 60 to 64 age group. Wow. I had at one time, listen to this. this so is you cr- guys are getting faster the older you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, and, and again, I should have been probably at least 20 seconds faster. But 
these guys came running around me, all three of them, three guys at the same time. And, and to, to, to set it up, you have your age on your back in these master's mm-hmm. races where you it tells Kinda you like what age triathlon. group you're in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know how old they are. And all three of the guys that were leading the 60-year-old group came around me at the same time. I mean, they were all within one second of each other. So it was fun because I kind of I kind of sat right there and just kind of watched them. You know, they were for, all passing for the this rest young of the whippersnapper in front of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was fun to watch them finish. Yeah, and so all three of them. Now there was another guy who was sixty six who finished with those folks as well. Those four guys were all four of the top five, I think, of the age graded winners for the for the whole thing so um, they were they were the best of the best Hmm. that were there but uh yeah it's interesting to see see those older guys running so well it's fun you know i don't watch a whole lot of racing and and you saying that reminds me of you know we had a track meet here last night and landing got in a kind of a duo with this guy they were running the mile and it was so fun to watch i mean not that you want to see violence, but these landing in this guy, they were kind of throwing elbows at one point, and really, it was just a great race to watch. But when they got done, they were high fiving each other. I mean, it was it was intense battle. Yep. But they were buddies at the end. Yeah. That, that's how, that's just that's the great thing about our sport. I it mean, is. you can get almost physical at times. Yeah. But everybody knows it's it's the heart behind it yes yeah. it's not you're trying to be mean it's it's competition well, and, and it was fun to watch last night yeah it really was it's like watching a boxing match yeah it really was. i mean for four laps yeah they were duking it out on the mile yep, yep. and yeah they were shoulder to shoulder landing ultimately got he succumbed to second place um but i told him i said i i was more proud of that race than some of the races he's won before because that's just fun to watch any huge pr for landon yeah and if that guy hadn't yeah. been there i don't know if he'd have pr'd or not yeah but uh, yeah. that guy really drug him to a, a good fast time and yeah. it was it was good for both of them yeah for sure yeah um well th- this back to this post you know she's um she didn't quit. She just took a break. And there's a difference between those things. And sometimes uh, we we need that. And the cool thing about this, in this case, Kelly realizes that there's value in that mm-hmm. running that she went through and all of that stuff that she went through. And what she's doing is she's focusing on the good side. Sure. Right? We so often focus on how bad it hurts or, you know, uh, I, I don't know where I'm going to fit it in my day or so many excuses why we don't want to go do it. Mm -hmm. And she's focusing on the positive aspects of running. And it it makes a difference in her uh, in her approach to it. Um, You know, we know that moving your body is always going to help you feel better, not just physically. But she mentions here it's good for her well-being, which is really that's part physical, but it's also part mental. So she realizes that. Um, And and we know We've talked about it a number of times that any time that you get in any kind of physical exercise, that's running, walking, or anything else, it is going to help you mentally, physically, um, and in a lot of cases, spiritually. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of the the parallels between faith and endurance that we've talked about so many times. Sure. So here's what I'm saying. Don't let your mind get in the way. Because what will happen, don't, don't let your mind tell you it's about anything other than something positive. And um, and you'll you'll be a lot better off in the long run. Yeah, I would I would even take it a step further and say don't let your feelings get in the way because sometimes yeah. we just don't feel like it. But our mind and our heart tells us this is good. You, we think back to times before when we got done, we did that crazy hard. I mean, after the podcast last week, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, after talking about Bubba and and hearing this stories that we taught it it gave me you know we left that podcast and went straight to the track after having abysmally failed on a workout just a few days before i i i I used that podcast and i mean you may disagree but i think i did pretty good on that workout and it was we we need these things we don't need to rely on you know some kind of motivation like a story but it's good to use those when they're there. I mean, For it absolutely sure. helped me. And so, yeah, I mean, sometimes we just don't feel like it. Yeah. And feelings are just feelings. We can override those. Uh, and you need to pull from wherever you need to pull 
to make that happen sometimes. Sometimes it's a it's somebody's story, which is why stories are so important. Yeah. And um, and you need to keep it in your mind for your race this weekend. Let's don't talk about that right now. Dude, no. <laughs> I'm struggling with. You know that you're going to be in the same place that the Dalton State track team is this weekend. They're going to be at Barry College on the same day. Really? Actually, about the time, sometime shortly after you get through with your race, um, they're going to start the 5K over at the track. Yeah, I mean, it's been years since I've been in the position of – because, you know, even even after Run For God started, my we've talked about our focus – my focus in running changed. Your focus in running changed once we started doing this. But mine got to the point where – I really didn't care about my time. You know, I was listening to Gay yeah. on her podcast. Yeah. That was a great podcast, by the way. She yeah. she poured her heart out. Yeah, Kudos to her. Um, but I was listening how she she got to the point where she time wasn't time didn't matter to her. Yeah. And I got to that point for years, which is okay. Mm-hmm. I got I walked and I didn't even run, which is okay. But for some reason, I've come back to. I'm not going to say I have a competitive bone in me, but there's something in there that's, I mean, I'm really stressing over like two minutes for yeah. this weekend. I I know I want to run this time, but two minutes slower will be so much easier, and I'm struggling. I'm having that battle in my mind right now because if I run this time, the, lo- the lower time, it's going to hurt, and I might have a risk of just blowing wide open. Yeah. But – I'm, I think I'm getting back to the point where I think it's worth the risk. Yeah. You know, I may yeah. fail abysmally again, but we learn a lot in those times. That's, you're right, exactly right. Well, let's talk about our trivia question from last week. The trivia question was, running has an effect on the immune system. Does running increase the efficiency of the immune system or decrease it? This was kind of a trick question mm-hmm. because the truth is, is that um, if you do the right amount of exercise, it increases your immune system and makes mm-hmm. you better able to fight off disease. If you do too much, then it decreases your immune system. So uh, I've been on both sides of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say it's really hard to get to the point where you do too much, mm-hmm. but uh, but you can. But here's what, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, most adults should get at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity each week. When you think about that, that's a pretty good bit of time, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it's a couple of hours of work there. And, uh, it, and if you do that, you'll boost your immune system. Uh, again, if you do too much, though, it can suppress your immune system um, because it seems that we rely on the recovery. That's what boosts our immune system mm-hmm. is in that recovery period, sort of mm-hmm. like our muscle. We mm-hmm. build muscle in the recovery time, and that's kind of how it does with the immune system. Um, the HH, HHS also recommends doing at least two days per week of muscle strengthening activities involving all major muscle groups in your legs, hips, back, abdomen, chest, shoulders, and arms. So that's another thing that um, we should be doing is, is getting in strength work because as we get older, we lose muscle and we need to keep keep that keep staying strong and it'll mm-hmm. help us in all areas of our life including our immunity um, so our immune system has taken on uh, kind of an entirely different meaning over the past couple of years hasn't it with COVID and we realized through COVID how important our immune system is well and it's why uh, you know you gotta be smart I think it's why it's so important when we when we do start feeling like we're getting sick that's the time it's it's still okay to get the workouts in, but if it's calling for, you know, a four by one mile track workout, that may not be the best option. Yeah. Because you, you all a lot of your body's resources are going to fight off whatever you're coming down with. Yeah. So you need to let that process work itself mm-hmm. out and maybe back down your end. So it's it's just being smart. Yeah. You know. It is. Yep. 
So this comes from Healthline.com. Six ways exercise benefits the immune system. So this is interesting because it tells you kind of how it works. Number one, exercise stimulates cellular immunity. According to a 2019 research review, moderate intensity exercise can stimulate cellular immunity by increasing the circulation of immune cells in your body. This helps your body better prepare for a future infection by detecting it earlier, which is pretty cool. Number two, exercise raises body temperature. So apparently if you raise your body temperature, it helps to fight things off better. And so even just the most moderate, you just if you get out there and you walk and you do it pretty vigorously, you're raising your body temperature. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to take it pretty easy not to be raising your body temperature. So that is good for for your body. we d- you do have to understand one of the things it says here. It's important to note that this claim lacks evidence-based support, but I can tell you I've seen it for sure. So that's why it's in here. Mm-hmm. Number three, exercise helps you sleep better. I think we all know that. Sure. The more we exercise, the better we sleep. And, of course, our immune system builds itself in that process of sleeping. And number four, exercise decreases risk of heart disease, diabetes, and other diseases. Exercise can reduce cardiovascular risk factors, prevent or delay development of type 2 diabetes, (coughs) increase good cholesterol, and lower resting heart rate. Having one or more of these conditions may make it more difficult for your immune system to ward off infections and viral illnesses. So if you can avoid those things, your immune system can stay stronger. Number five, exercise decreases stress and other conditions such as depression. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we've anybody who's run for any period of time realizes that running can be a good stress reducer. Absolutely. And we know I mean, we don't need any study to tell us how detrimental stress is to us. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Uh, and, And in particular, physically for our immune system. And then last, uh, exercise reduces inflammation. But here again, this goes right back to that same thing where exercise reduces inflammation if you do it in a moderate amount. If you do a lot of it, ultra marathoners are not reducing inflammation. (laughs) Sure. So, uh, So it depends on how much you do. But the bottom line is that moderate exercise with appropriate rest periods can maximize the effectiveness of your body's inflammatory immune response lowering your your risk of chronic inflammation yeah i think you know the the moral of the story here is number one it's it's all about moderation just yeah. about with anything right but also you know especially with the people who are listening who may be doing the couch to marathon as your as your activity level increases You've got to be much more intentional about the recovery side of it. Yes. Um, because the recovery is just as important or possibly even more important than the exercise itself. Yep. So, you know, you go out for that long run. You've got to be intentional about don't just schedule an hour and a half for that long run. Schedule two and a half hours, an hour and a half for the long run, and then an hour when you get done to kind of what I call self-medicate, you know, mm-hmm. take the ice bath, get your feet up, get your compression on and do nothing because that one hour immediately after, you know, a, a long effort like that, I mean, it's 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 critical. It's yeah. not just good. I think it's critical to really kickstart, yeah. you know, getting in the carbs and the or the chocolate milk or whatever the recovery drink, all of that stuff really kickstarts and boosts that um that healing process That's which right. is critical which includes the immune system yeah. absolutely yeah for sure so yeah so you know exercise is definitely good for the immune system i can tell you this from a rest standpoint i if i if i go two or three days in a row with very little sleep yeah it always affects oh, my health and it's cumulative yes yeah. yeah i could yeah a day of no sleep doesn't bother me yeah Two days, it starts to bother me. Three days, I'm done. Yeah. I'm going to get We're sick. zombies. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So with the 5K, run for God 5K weekend. Yeah. Not, I not mean, as of this, this releasing, we're basically a month away. There's still time. Um, if you're out there and you're a Run Club member, uh, obviously, you get to race the, the race for free. You get to run the race for free. If you haven't gotten your code yet, we did send those codes out. Uh, but for whatever reason, you didn't get it or you didn't catch the email or it got deleted or something, email holly at runforgod.com and she'll get you that code. Uh, but yeah, we got a lot of people signing up. We got a lot of people coming in from 
from a lot of different places for the for the whole weekend. Again, this is a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday night we're doing things together. Saturday morning we're running together. Saturday night we're having a banquet together. Sunday morning we're worshiping together. It's incredible. April the fourteenth through the sixteenth. The race is on the fifteenth on Saturday. Um, but this is you and I've talked about it several times. This is one of our favorite weekends of the year, and it's because we get to meet. All of you out there who listen to this podcast, we 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 feel like we're friends, and many of you we've never actually met. So this is just the opportunity to come together and meet all these incredible Run Club members, and I, I can't wait. It's a month away. Get signed up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. As a Christian runner, you might find it hard to decide what to listen to while you run. If you are looking for positive and Christian music that will help you keep your pace, check out the Radioactive Station on the new J Radio. We'll take care of picking the music so that you can concentrate on your run. Plus, you can count on us to make sure that the music is uplifting and encouraging. Check out JRadio.com or download the app in your app store. All right, we're back, and I have uh, I've received a few stories lately. We're going to share uh, a story actually today that I received back a while back, and somehow I lost it. I thought I had used actually I had it. I thought I had used it, and I filed it away as used, and I hadn't used mm. it. And so uh, we're going to share that story today. I think you're going to love it. Uh, but so many of you out there have ideas. You have stories. You're going to hear the story you're hearing today is not really about one particular incident. Mm -hmm. It's just somebody's general thoughts on running and, and how things go. And so, uh, well, let me challenge everybody out there. Maybe you're maybe you're on the couch to marathon and you're thinking, I'm going to wait till I cross that marathon finish line to share my story. That's great. We love those stories and we will absolutely use those stories. But sometimes the best stories are the ones that are during the the middle of the process maybe when you're struggling yeah um people need to hear that side too so if you're out there and and you're struggling some of the best accountability is when you tell your story yeah uh, tell about your struggles i've, I've aired my laundry out here uh, mm -hmm. my process of coming back to running it holds me accountable yeah so if you're out there and maybe you're on the couch to marathon you know we're you're into the the meat of the 5k right now and it's just hard tell us about it there, there is a lesson in that story, and we will use it. Yeah. And uh, so don't be afraid to – I mean, yes, tell your story at the end because that's the, that's the cool part. Yeah. But there's a lot to be learned right now, so, so share that with us. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask a weird question. <laughs> Do you think running with good company helps you get faster, or does it slow you down? I think there's an argument to be made on both sides. Uh, and the reason I bring it up is because in that race that I ran this weekend, mm -hmm. a good friend of mine was there. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of hooked up with him about, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before race time. And so we talked and we were catching up and it distracted me to some degree. I'm not blaming him at all in, in that, but it did distract me. And I wonder if when it got hard in the race, I really backed off. Um, I should have gone a little harder. Uh, those three sixty-year-old guys should never have gotten caught up to me. <laughs> yeah, but it—it's because I was distracted. And sometimes when we hang out with people we really like and that kind of, th we, we get distracted, and we don't work as hard as we might if we were on our own. I think there's—I think there's two very polar opposite personalities here. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've got two examples because I read this and I really thought about what you said. You know, this was before you came on board helping coach the the triathlon team when the kids were real little, like six, seven, eight. We would go to some of these races, and especially Lane. Lane was the worst. He would just tie himself up in knots mm -hmm. before a race, and it 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 affected his race in a bad way. So I'll never forget. We were, I think, we were in Des Moines, Iowa, and we had. 15 20 kids there for this race and <clears throat> an hour before the race i had them out in this field playing football yeah and i'll never forget the other teams were looking at me like mitchell has lost his mind he's got they're about to run this critical race it's national championships are on the line qualification spots and mitchell's got his team playing football what i saw was that especially young people yeah it's 
they can sock themselves out because that's a, that's kind of a something you have to learn yeah. to do to, to really focus in a good way. But then I say that, and then I'll never forget looking back at previous Olympics, and there's there's two people that really stick out on my mind who are on opposite sides of this. In the swimming, if you watch Ryan Lochte before a big event, yeah, he's out talking to teammates. You, you see him walking around the pool deck, mingling. I mean, this is right before some big races. Yeah, he's he's not, or it appears that he's not focused on the race. Contrast that with Michael Phelps. Huh. If you've ever seen Michael Phelps before a yeah. race, he has the big headphones on. He's found a corner somewhere. The camera always finds him, but he's he's gotten away from everybody. A lot of times he has a towel over his head, and he's got his head down, and you can tell he's laser-focused. Two world-class swimmers that do this very differently. So that tells me it's very individualized. Yeah, yeah. That's you a know. good way to put it. And I, I think know. you're right. I yeah. think you're absolutely right, yeah. I don't like to think about... Well, I told you on one of the last workouts we did that you did yeah. with me, I just I got out on the track and I was like, let's go. I don't want to sit here and think about this because yeah. I'm just going to think about how it hurts. And that's – I use that in a – I channel that in a bad way. Yeah. But you channel it in a good way. So, well, You know what I found is I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about this race before the race day. Hmm. So if I had spent a lot of time really visualizing and getting myself steeled and prepared for the the discomfort and, and that kind of thing, and if I knew the course, I didn't know the course, and I didn't realize the last mile was uphill. But if I would have known that and I would have really focused on that, then that distraction the 30 minutes before wouldn't have made any difference probably. Mm -hmm. So that's another issue as well is mm -hmm. I didn't do everything I needed to do in the days leading up to to be ready for it either so but you know what's funny about everything we're sitting here talking about it has nothing to do with how fast we are that's right <laughs> it has everything to do with what's between our ears yep that's exactly right well this week's story comes from one of our favorites <laughs> um if you wanted to hear some humor well, I'm going to give you Jerry Snyder because mm -hmm. that guy has got a sense of humor. He loves to make people laugh, and you can tell by listening to his stories. And we have another one from him, and this one is called The Chicken and the Frog. <laughs> that name just makes me laugh. <laughs> you may be disappointed if you fail, but you are doomed if you don't try. That comes from Beverly Sills, an opera singer. Not long ago, my wife decided she wanted to raise chickens in our backyard. She asked me to go to the library and get some books on the subject. That's a waste of time, I said. Chickens can't read. <laughs> to, to make a long story short, my wife is now feeding the chickens, and I spend my evenings reading to them. <laughs> If I asked you why did the chicken cross the road and you said to get to the other side, you would be correct. But not many people know what the chicken did when he got there. I heard he was on his way to the library. Yes, I said the library. He walked in, approached the librarian, and said, book, book. <laughs> to say the least, the librarian thought it was a little strange for a chicken to be in a library in the first place. What is he up to? So when the chicken checked out a book and left, the librarian followed him. The chicken crossed the road again and headed out of town. When he got to the park where there was a pond, he sat the book down in front of a frog, and the frog looked at the book and turned to the chicken and said, Read it. Read it. <laughs> I heard from a reliable source that the book the chicken had checked out of the library was Running in Faith, Devotions for Runners, published by Guidepost Books. The moral of the story is, if a chicken and a frog can train for a marathon, you and I can too. And chances are, if we follow the training plan, get inspired from the stories in the book, and trust in God, we won't croak. <laughs> so tomorrow, when you hear the rooster sound off, hop out of bed and get started. If you don't have a rooster, set your alarm clock one hour early. No excuses. Get egg-sided. Don't chicken out. 
<laughs> super successful businessman Arnold H. Glasgow said, the key to everything is patience. You get the chicken by hatching the egg, not by smashing it. My best bet is the chicken and the frog will start out training for a 5K, and once they have a cackling good time with that race, progress to a 10K, then a half marathon, hopping to the starting line of a marathon. Helen Keller liked to say, Life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing. I'm more than certain the happiest frogs and chickens are those who, every now and then, leave the lily pad and fly the coop for a new adventure. So lace up your running shoes, have some fun, and cross the road. And if you happen to see a chicken and a frog running beside you in your next race, be sure to say hello. <laughs> I'm pretty fun. I'm pretty sure Jerry has fun thinking about the fact look i'm writing this but dean's gonna have to read this <laughs> you may be right great story jerry that's uh it's just what i needed today i love this kind of sense of humor you know there's different types of sense of humor Slapstick, yeah. and this this just silliness is just i just love it i love the old remember the old um movies airplane mm-hmm. naked gun those types of movies the uh the show the goldbergs mm-hmm. I never just, saw that. It's just so funny. It's just the dialogue is just. It's the Seinfeld. Outlandish. Humor, yeah. yeah, it's Seinfeld's another one. But oh, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. So, um, But I was pretty sure that chickens can't read. I already knew that. So yeah. I didn't learn that. But, uh, but Jerry has a really serious message under all of the humor he's got in here. And that message is, is that you can do it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that you can train for a marathon. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've seen some pretty unlikely people at the marathon finish line. Mm-hmm. And you only do that by, as Jerry talks about, crossing the road, getting out of your, your comfort zone. It all starts with one step. That's right. That's right. And we have, you know, from a, <coughs> a, a run club perspective we have so many resources for that too you know the facebook group and run club social we have hundreds of videos the the podcast what we're doing right now mm-hmm. um the bible in a year thing we just started um you don't really have a good excuse not to give it a shot i was talking with a lady yesterday i met at the bank of all places and i'm not even sure how we got to talk she went to uh the, the lady went to school with your father and mother. Hmm. And so she she asked about you, and she started talking about she still wants to run a marathon, she said, but she's getting too old. Mm-mm. And I said, go to runforgod.com. Mm-hmm. You can do it. We've seen so many people do it, and you can do it too. And so hopefully she will. Um, because there's a lot of people out there with that thought, that, that train of thought of, I'm just too old. It's, it, it's past time for me to be able to do that. Well, it's not. We disagree. That's right. Yeah. We've seen it too many times. We, we the proof the proof is in the number of people that have done it. Yep. Yeah. And we like you said, we've seen some people who, if we were being honest, we probably had our doubts. We we're like, hmm, I don't, I don't know. Yep. But over and over again, we we've learned not to say that anymore. That's for sure. Because you know you you get immersed into a group like this, um, and you can do some pretty cool things, some pretty yeah. special things when you really focus on it and maybe the biggest excuse is people say i just don't have the time for it and the truth is is that people who are busy always find time for whatever they want to do right and you can too and so we all have 24 hours in a day that's right and lots of very very busy matter of fact i would say the average marathon finisher is probably busier than the average person (laughs) in general Mm -hmm. before they even start training for that marathon I would guess because they're type A personalities, and it's and you, but you got to do it right. I yeah. think this is the problem with a lot of. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about her on here because I sent her a message. Rachel Cruz, who is Dave Ramsey's daughter, she put this post on social media the other day, and she she was in her closet, and she pulled up a pair of running shoes. She said, "I just want you to know, a few years ago, I uh, bought these running shoes, and I decided I was going to run. She wanted to run a half marathon." She said, I'm not a runner. I've never run in my life. She said, so I bought the shoes. I bought the socks. I bought the gear. I bought everything, she said, in my um, third workout. I was supposed to run a mile and a half, and I got my car and went home. She said, running is just stupid. 
<laughs> and she was making light of it and funny. Yeah. And I sent her a message. I don't know if she'll ever respond to it, but I sent her a message and I said, come around for God.com. We'll help you get there. Because the thing that stuck out in me is her third workout is a mile and a half. Is a mile and a half. Yeah. I don't know where she's getting her workouts, but that is the wrong way to go about it. But for so many people, that's how they start this sport. <laughs> that's right. And they get injured, burn out, hurt, whatever. And, and they say running stupid. Well, it's not. It's it's a great sport, but you got to enter it smart. And that's that's where I feel like we shine is yep. because we take – we're cheerleading the person that has never done it before. So, Rachel Cruz, if you're out there listening, if, if you're out there and you know Rachel Cruz, tag her on this post. We would love to have her in this program because she's a really cool lady. Yeah. But uh, running is not stupid. That but right. you can do it in a stupid way. That's that's right. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's called biting off more than you can chew. Yeah. <laughs> How about this scripture passage from Romans twelve twelve? Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Again, there it's very simple. There's reason to be joyful. Um, and it lies in that hope that we have in, in Jesus Christ, and um, that allows us to be patient in affliction. But there's so much practical advice in Romans 12, mm-hmm. so I just kind of cut some of that out and just wanted to read some, because it's so practical. It says, from verse 9, it says, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share the with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay someone evil for evil be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone if it is possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone do not take revenge my dear friends but leave room for god's wrath for it is written it is mine to avenge i will repay says the lord on the contrary if your enemy is hungry feed him if he is thirsty give him something to drink in doing this you will heap burning coals on his head do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good you know, that's the cool thing about Scripture. You can take this one snippet, and if you just do this, yeah, your no, life will be changed. That's right. And we have a whole book with this same stuff in it. Um, that's some good insight, Dean. It really is. <clears throat> and it's it's just so – people look at the Bible and think about the – you know, I mean, there are people who have a hard time wrapping their head around the Bible because of some of the stories that are in there. They're pretty fantastical, right? Sure. I mean, science fiction movies are no, no, no yeah. further stretch than some of the things that are in the Bible. But – there's so much practical in there, and this is what this is what all of this is. It's just practical. I don't care if you if you're not a Christian and you just followed this stuff, you'd be better off. Absolutely. You know, obviously, you you need that relationship. But sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, scripture passage number two: Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. That comes from Proverbs sixteen three. You know, I <clears throat> I read this and I. I don't want this to sound bad. I didn't. I didn't. I don't like that translation. Yeah. So I went to the New King James, and it says, "Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established." I like. I like the New King James version because it seems to be more future tense rather than past tense. Good. Whatever this version this came from, it it almost sounds like do it and commit it to God. Yeah. But the way the reason I like the New King James is is it says commit to God yeah and then go do and your your thoughts will be established because if we focus on God if we meditate on God if we in God's word daily he will establish our thoughts and he will only put thoughts in our head that are in his will right and I, I don't know I just like that version better but I love this verse I, and I do too and that's kind of some of my notes that I wrote down here was that you know you it's not whatever you do commit it to God because there's some things that you 
I mean, if you're going to take revenge on somebody, yeah. who did you wrong? And we just read the, in Romans what it says sure. about taking revenge on people. Well, God's not going to bless that right. because that's not of God. Yeah. And so you have to focus on, and your point is very good, because we have to focus on what God – if we're in God's will – then God is going to make sure our plan succeeds. But so many times we run rough shot and we we start this thing, and it can be a very good thing, a For noble sure. thing. Yeah. It could be a godly thing. Mm-hmm. And we go out there and we start it, and then we ask God to come along beside us and bless it. And that's the wrong way of looking at things. Yeah. You commit yourself to God, and he will take you where he's working. I We go back to David Hendricks, who always famously said, I want to find where God's working and go there. Yeah, That should be our posture, not I want to go here and I want God to come with me. That's not how this works. Yep, yep, good good point. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You know, whether you eat, yeah. drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I, I, I love that verse. And another p- passage from Galatians 6, 9 <clears throat> Let's not get tired of doing good, because in time, we'll have a harvest if we don't give up. (laughs) I I like that. This is a whole, this whole section in Galatians is very interesting. Um, He's talking about how we we are to carry one another's burdens. I mean, it's a picture of Run Club. It's Mm -hmm. what Run Club does, right? Uh, How we should do some things that our society, frankly, has forgotten about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chapter 6 starts off with, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watching yourselves, or you also may be tempted. This is exactly the opposite of cancel culture. The idea that as soon as somebody does something we don't like, we're just going to shun that person from now on. Now, should we, we, we shouldn't be up, lifting those people mm-hmm. but we also um, you know I don't know how many times we've seen people who did something 30 years ago 20 years ago and they did something wrong and and maybe it wasn't good maybe it really was a bad thing but they're changed today and it's clear they're different today and yet we're still we're on them about that thing they did 20 years ago it's like that's so that's so anti-biblical and of course some Christians do that I hate to see that when I see that Verse 3 then says, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. <laughs> you know, it's good to have confidence in yourself. But, but it's can, not good to have hubris. That's it's, right. He, yep. You got to understand that it's there again. We like to go rough shot. We, yep. we, we feel like we can do anything. That is wrong. We, we can do nothing without God behind us. Yep. And uh, we got to We got to We got to keep the the roles lined up here and then i really like where verse five says for each one should carry their own load mm-hmm. because we we often think that whenever we try to gently persuade even cajole uh, somebody into doing something uh, that maybe they don't feel like they want to do that that's a bad thing mm-hmm. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to that point where they're doing their own thing. You know, it's the old, you know, teach a, you know, the the fishing thing about teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, we should be helping people, but we should be helping people to carry their own load, yeah. not to do it for them. Right. And um, that's and a, in our culture today. We've we've kind of taken that side too far. We're we're giving everybody fish. We're not yes. teaching them to fish. That's right. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the saying is give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. Teach him to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime. Right. And uh, we, we've kind of gotten away from that in our society. With I mean, we, you can get social, political, you can get whatever. But in really all aspects of our society, we've went that way. We've, we've taught people to rely on things, programs governments all this stuff when we 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 need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and and pray to God that he's there with us doing that because me and God can do a lot yeah me and the government can only do so much <laughs> and it's very little <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah that's a good point uh, yeah i i just uh God expects us to help ourselves um so I think we should take that very seriously. Here's a question. 
Do you have any unusual role models like a chicken or a frog? You know, I read this, Dean, and a story really stuck out to me because it's a story that just happened not before last. Um, you know, I, I say as, as a family, we we typically read through the Bible as a family. Well, right now we're we're reading a book, and I'm not going to give the name of the book. Some people listening may figure out what the book is, but I'm not going to give the name. But we're reading this book, and the the premise of this book is is to do it. <laughs> I've gotten uncomfortable with this book because I feel like it is throwing, in some cases, it's throwing mud on some ways of doing ministry. Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of throwing mud on on big churches. Mm -hmm. It's kind of throwing mud on, 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 I'm just going to leave it at that. It's kind of throwing mud on certain ways. But I, I keep reading it because I know it's not the author's heart. Because I know how the author does ministry. And so I've really gotten uncomfortable with like, you know, wait a minute. There's nothing wrong with doing ministry that way. Right. Even though he's kind of saying, it, it appears that he's saying we shouldn't be doing ministry that way. Yeah. And I've really been struggling with it. And we've had conversations as a family. And I'm like, gosh, I just, I know, I know this guy doesn't believe this, but he's saying this in this book. And Lane, you know, Lane is 20 years old now. He's chosen to live at home while he's going to college. So if you're living in my house, we're still having Bible time every night. Mm -hmm. And so we get together as a family. And Lane the other night, who's been on this podcast a couple times, he said, I've got a little bit different take on this. And, you know, I still have the dad posture. I'm like, go ahead, you know. Yeah. But what continued out of his mouth really made me sit back and it changed my whole way of thinking. He said... He said, you remember, and he, he knows how to get me because he brings my own words back up. Yeah. He said, you remember when we were younger and you used to talk about how when I would get on like a supplement or uh, a new pair of shoes and all these things that was going to make me faster. He said, you would always bring me back to it's not the shoes that make you faster. Mm-hmm. It's not the supplement that makes you faster. It's the hard work that makes you faster. He said, and you would say it in a way that almost sounded like you didn't like the shoes and you didn't like the supplement. He said, but I knew it wasn't that you had a problem with the supplement. You didn't have a problem with the shoe. You just wanted to keep my focus on what was important and he said I think that's what the author is doing here is he's not saying that a big church is bad he's not saying that cushion seats or a praise band is bad he's saying but if that's where we put our faith yeah. that will only last a short period of time just like if we put our faith in a pair of running shoes our running career is only going to last a very short period of time and it just sat me back. Yeah. And I was like, and so to answer Jerry's questions, ironically, one of my role models is now my kids. And that's so weird, but, you know, they're starting to get these brains of their own and their own thoughts. And it's it's really cool to see. And I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. Oh, yeah. Your kids say things and you're like, okay. Yeah. I can learn from my kids in this yeah. case. So I don't know. I thought that was a really cool story of how. Sometimes the people you least expect to get it, get it better than we do. Well, you know, we've got a real good example of that right now in movie theaters. Yeah. The Jesus Revolution movie. I mean, I don't know how many folks out there have seen it, but, you know, that movie is really about Chuck Smith just saying the the traditional things that we've been doing isn't working and what, what would happen. If, if we, we went a whole different. way, cra- I mean, a crazy direction, right? Yeah. And at that point in time, and even him himself, he was like, "That's that makes no sense." And yeah. but all he did was listen to God, and it was clear that God was in in all of that stuff, and it it changed. I mean, it, it led to a huge revival, yeah. all across the country, yeah. Because one man said, "Well, maybe as long as I keep my focus." 
on Jesus and our focus is right, then we can do things in a lot of different ways. Well, I've said it many times, and I've always used Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, and Will Graham as an example. You've got those three generations there of people who – and it's why I have problems with – people in the church my church you know even who he say we we don't need to do it this way if if the gospel is the focus and the message doesn't change the method by which we share it should absolutely change yeah and that may seem wrong to some people but i feel like it's absolutely right yeah. You know, Paul said, I'm all things to all people. You know, we we have to change with the times in the way we deliver things. The message should never change. That's why I say you can close your eyes and watch Billy Graham from the 50s and watch Will Graham from today. You can close your eyes. Nothing has changed. Yeah. What you audibly hear is God loves you mm-hmm. and you need to come to a saving relationship with him so that you can spend eternity with him. Now, you open your eyes and you see three-piece suits in the 1950s, women with long dresses down to their ankle, and everybody in a completely different posture. And fast forward to Will Graham, a crusade of his today where you got Lecrae hopping around on the stage. The method by which they're sharing is completely different. But the message is exactly the same. And I think yeah. that's that's the point of the book that I was reading, that we're reading as a family. That's the point of the Jesus Revolution. And even down, on down in here, you've, you've got some other things that are lining up with exactly what we're saying. We've kind of refocused this ministry that this is, this is God's ministry that talks about running. Yeah. We're not a running ministry that talks about God. Mm-hmm. And it's so cool how it's like God is putting all these touch points, these street lights that we yeah. talk about. He's lighting all these things up. You started the Bible in the year at the same exact time I started something and I'm working on it. And we're not going to talk about it right now. But it's it's like God puts a movie, a book, a child all these things in society, he's lining some things up right now that I feel like we're on the cusp of something great. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm yeah. excited to to be sitting here in the in the front row, yeah, kind of leading to your story, yeah. Um, it's good, uh, good stuff. It's cool where we're at, yeah. Well, back to this question: the unusual role models. You know, I wrote a story a couple of years mm-hmm. ago, I think, called "Run Like a Dog." Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, that came to mind when I read this because I, I think about my dog and my dog. She's she's so loyal. She loves me no matter what. She's always glad to see me. But she loves to run just for running's sake yeah. because it's fun. It's enjoyable. I don't know if it's because she knows it's good for her or just she just likes to do. I don't know what the story is, but she just loves to do it. This morning, just this morning, she was. Our, she goes to our neighbor's yard occasionally, and there's a place there where she can look out over a pasture, and there's some cows and stuff down there. She likes to go look at the cows. Mm-hmm. And then I'll call her, and she it's a little bit of a downhill run back to the house, and she just goes all out. Yeah. And it's almost like you can see the smile on her face running back. And uh, so my, my role model is a dog. <laughs> Another question. What is your next God-inspired adventure? I think I'm still heavily invested in the one that I'm, I'm on now. This Bible in a Year series has been – it's it's a lot of work, mm-hmm. but it's it's been pretty cool. And so uh, I'm focusing on that. Uh, but I also – want to do some other things in in the future i just ran that national championship event i'm hoping to be able to do more of that in the near future because i really enjoy doing that and one of the cool things about that for me um, and and kind of back to this question of god inspired adventures is people who are people who still love to just pound themselves to death when they're 50 something years old (laughs) Are a little uh, bit weird. They're a little bit weird. <laughs> they're definitely type A type people, sure. right? And so um, that's an opportunity because type A type people a lot of times have a hard time <coughs> hearing the gospel. It's a huge mission field. It is a huge mission field. And so um, 
I hope that I can be that light in that group of people because that's those are for lack of a better way of putting it those are my people Mm -hmm. you know and so uh, I have this opportunity to be this bright light you know I was talking with the guy the guy that's from California that's beat me I had a 15 minute conversation with him uh, this past weekend he's clearly in a different direction Mm -hmm. and and I hope that we we get to a point in these races where we have some really serious philosophical discussions about who God is you know it just struck me you you obviously went and saw the Jesus Revolution Mm -hmm. well Holly and I did too we went and saw it as a family Friday night and it just hit me when you were talking that you know the whole premise behind the Jesus Revolution was you know that the hippies coming to know Christ and Chuck Smith was saying in that movie he he was said or somebody was telling him that no it was Lonnie telling him you know these people they're they're searching Mm -hmm. you know they're searching for they think LSD and music is is their salvation and at our inner core we're all searching for salvation Mm -hmm. we know that there is only one salvation but to a lot of people they don't know that you know how can they come to know Christ if they don't know about Christ and it just struck me when you said that that there's so many people in the running world you talk about type A's and that's a lot of what's in the running world and they're doing the same thing it, it's not LSD and rock and roll. It's running. Yeah, it's where I was headed. That's right. It's where so many people. It's like, oh, this is, this is what I was born to do. Yeah, you hear people say that. Mm-hmm. Well, no, we're not. We're not born to do that. We're born to have a a relationship with Jesus Christ and and praise Him for eternity. That's what each of us were born to do. But when it really hit me the other night in that movie that when we when we put the glasses on of seeing people as they're searching yeah, and they just haven't found the focal point of what life is really all about, we look at them different. Yeah. And in the case of the Jesus revolution, um, Chuck Smith no longer looked at them as stupid hippie kids. Yep. He looked at them as these people are looking for Christ and I know where he's at. Yep, and when he looked at it that way, just like you're talking about the running community, mm-hmm. you're doing that with these master runners and national championships, and that's really where they congregate. Mm-hmm. If I win this national championship, I found the meaning to life. Right. What a mission field! Yeah, that's um, that's pretty cool, Dean. Very, very, very similar. Last question: Without being boastful, how can you inspire others? Let's. Kind of what I was just talking about. I kind of got ahead of myself. That you know, I hope that that just being being there and being a good example and uh, injecting my faith into just daily conversations with these folks that it makes a difference for mm-hmm. for somebody. Yeah, um, I know that uh, it, it's amazing. Sometimes you think, even even with me and, and what I do, I think a lot of times I wonder whether anybody really is paying attention. Now I know I hear you know young people a lot of times come and say you know and they ask my opinion or whatever for things, but um, you know when I see somebody like um, you know our friend Ryan Trum, mm-hmm. you know he started the plant based diet. Mm-hmm. because he saw the results I got from it. Mm-hmm. And now he's doing that. And he had the same results. And I didn't I didn't really discuss it in detail with him. I didn't say, hey, you should try this. Mm-hmm. I just lived a life in a certain way, and he looked at it and went, huh, that looks pretty appealing. I think I'll try that. And you told him what it's done in your life. You didn't tell him, you need to do this. Right, exactly. And that's there's a lesson there on how we share the gospel. Yep. yep. Tell we, people what God's done in your life. It's why our stories are so important. That's right. And it can make, I mean, it can be everything to somebody, to, to that one person out there that it just changes their life. I think for me, it's it's simplicity. You know, we've talked a lot about this in recent podcasts, but um, we've become so complex and so busy. Um, I, I guess I've been trying to make it my goal to 
remove things from my schedule and to really focus on what's left we've we've become doers of many things and masters of none um and i think people are really drawn to um a different way yeah. and a more simple way and that's that's the way i'm trying to live right now i sometimes i i love a good busy schedule but i'm i'm really trying to 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 not do that and focus on the things that God is really calling me to do this project I'm working on right now. It's just one of those. I, I want to, yeah. I'm really focused on praying through it and not getting through it. Yeah. And, um, it's taken much longer than I thought. It's teaching me patience. It's what I thought was going to be a quick read is now turned into a mini version of a novel. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think in our own ways, we both have, things that we're doing that it's obvious God is tying some of these things together yeah. and I'm, I'm really excited w- what that means for this ministry because um, it does feel like we're we're moving in a slightly different direction than we have in the past and that's a good thing yeah it's really exciting yeah do you struggle with motivation to exercise? Are you looking for something that will challenge you and inspire and motivate you? The Run for God Run Club is just what you need to get off the couch and on your way to a fitter, healthier you. Stop trying to get into better shape and do it. With the help and inspiration of thousands of others who are going through the same challenges you face, whether you're participating in the Couch to Marathon Challenge or just looking for a daily pick-me-up to get active, join the Run for God Run Club today. You can join for as little as 27 cents a day. So what are you waiting for? Get started today at www.runforgod.com. All right, so you and I like to talk about how there is no magic to a training plan. And I read an article recently that discussed this one guy who was saying that everything I need to know about endurance training can be learned from the 1964 5,000-meter final. (laughs) And uh, it was interesting because what he did was he then took each one of the the four, these world-class names that we know today, guys, and he talked about their training plans. You know, one of them was a Mihaly Igloy disciple who was doing, I mean, he would do sometimes twice a day, would do short, fast intervals, and he was successful at the 5K. Another guy was almost exclusively long, slow running. Another guy was more like what we do a lot today is the intense training interspersed with with rest and the the alternation but these four guys all took very different paths and then here they were in the finals of the 5000 meter championship in 1964 it was a great picture of of what what it was and i thought it was interesting because today i don't know if you've if you've noticed but the big talk technically from a training standpoint right now in the running community is double threshold days so where people do double threshold days, the Norwegians, you know, Blumenthal, the triathlete, uh, the Ingebrigtsens, they do it. This, and there's others uh, from Norway that have kind of kind of pioneered this thing where they do two sessions of threshold training in a day. Hmm. And it's it's very technical because what they do is they're actually pricking their finger or their ear during the workout to find out what their lactate levels are to keep a lot them of them are wearing the the thing in your arm too yeah yeah that's a new thing now and so you got all of this this stuff that um that that's going on with with training and i'll be honest with you i've said this before i've probably said it on this podcast if i could only do one workout period and i couldn't do anything else but i could do one workout and then easy running it would be threshold type runs Mm -hmm. we call them tempo runs Mm -hmm. in our uh in our training plans and um they're 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 finding them to be extremely beneficial now the way they're doing them is is completely different than what we not completely different they do some some 
tempo runs like we do them, but they also do a lot of shorter stuff mm-hmm. where they do the very little rest, but they do so that their lactate level goes up and comes back down, and they try to keep that lactate level about the same as you mm-hmm. would. On a, but you can't do too much mm-hmm. or it, it – because your lactate level rises as you go, mm-hmm. and so you you can only go so far before it gets too high. And you're and there's apparently there's the, there's a point at which when your lactate level gets too high, I mean all of a sudden it the the recovery required mm-hmm. is just exponentially larger. Yeah, and so the idea is to stay just on the other side of that line. Yeah, we we, we I mean the. the the technical term for that is your lactic threshold. Yep. It's it's where, but as kids, you know, with kids, we used to you, you could you'd make them go cross-sided if you started saying everything that you just said. Yeah, yeah. To dumb that down, your lactic threshold is the point by, from which you go from breathing heavy to out of control. Mm-hmm. You, you can take all that science and pull it down to now. I get what they're doing; they're scientifically finding exactly where that line is. And training just below it. Right. And, you know, because the idea, if you're racing at that caliber, that level, you need to be able to get, you know, one centimeter below that line, not a foot below that line. Right. And so, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to see some of the technology out there now, but it kind of goes back to what Lane said. Yeah. In my conversation with him. Yep. It, it comes down to, consistency over time produces results yep don't get so focused on your lactic threshold that you forego the long run that's right because that lactic threshold isn't going to get you to the podium to doing hard things consistently over time is going to get the results you want yep that's that's true All right, it is a time for Dean's thoughts, and that's a time when I share something that I've written about the intersection between running and faith. Since we shared a Jerry story today, (laughs) this first example in this story goes right along with it. It's called The Front Row. I remember a commercial from the 80s starring Bob Euchre. He was a former Major League Baseball player, though not a very notable one. What made Bob Euchre famous was that although he was a poor player, he had a great sense of humor. He loved to make fun of himself. In the ad, Bob is in a ballpark commenting about how nice it was to be a former Major League Baseball player. He says, I just call the front office and bingo, free tickets to the game. And then he sits down uh, and then an usher comes by to ask him to move because he's sitting in the wrong seats. Bob says, I must be in the front row. (laughs) And then, of course, the commercial ends with him out in the nosebleed section of the ballpark all by himself. (laughs) I want to share a time when I really was in the front row. You see, I found myself on the brink of being kicked out of school while attending Georgia Tech. They had sent me a nice letter explaining that if I had another quarter like the last one, they would politely ask me to leave. They were kind enough to give me another chance and place me on academic probation. At this point, I figured I could respond either of two ways. I could give up. But honestly, if I was going to give up, I wanted to do it on my terms, not because they pressured me into it. My other option was to change my habits and in turn my academic fortunes. I changed several habits, but there was one that stood out. I began sitting in the front row of every class. It forced me to pay attention, and since my eyesight has always been poor, it helped me to see better, too. I went from academic probation to the dean's list the first quarter I tried it. As a matter of fact, I made the dean's list five of my last six quarters. So what does that have to do with running? It's all about radical change. If you're going to change direction in an area of your life where you are falling short, you must make radical changes to be successful. You don't like running in the morning, even though it's the best time for you to fit it in? Well, do it anyway. I didn't want to sit in the front row. I just did it. You want to eat better? Throw out all the bad food you have and don't let it back in your house. If the only choice is healthy food, you'll eat it. Do you want to know the best part of sitting in the front row? Every quarter that passed, it got easier and easier to sit there because I saw the progress I was making. And it will work for you, too. 
If you're struggling with your running or walking, what radical change can you make to ensure your success? Get creative. Try anything. At first glance, you wouldn't think sitting in the front row would yield such optimistic results, but it did. Maybe there's a simple change you can make, too. How about your spiritual life? Sometimes the only way we can establish a strong prayer life or Bible study time is by setting an alarm, putting everything else aside, and just doing it no matter what else is going on. Maybe you need to take an even more radical approach and create a prayer closet. Whatever it takes, it will be worth it. I have found that sometimes it takes radical action to change a habit, be it in college, in running, or my quiet time. And in each case, I found that it was, it was worth the change. You can make an impactful changes, too. I was really uncomfortable the first time I sat in the front row of a classroom, but it was worth it. And when my father calls me home, I don't know how he's going to do it, but I'm pretty sure we'll all be in the front row worshiping the creator of the universe for eternity. As the song says, what a glorious day that will be. Hmm. That's a great story, Dean. <clears throat> you know, I had to sit on the front row one time. I had my own assigned seat on the front row of the school bus. Oh. Tammy Blevins, I'll never forget, Sean's mother was my school bus driver. <laughs> And uh, I was not the best person on the school bus. I liked, I was a little bit rowdy. And so for the last half of, I think, my first grade year, I had, I was the only person that had an assigned seat. And it was mandated. It wasn't like you. You decided. Yeah. I had an assigned seat on the front row. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm right there. You started behaving yourself better, too, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I did. Because I knew that Tammy knew my mom very well. Yeah. <laughs> they talked, so. It's uh, a great story. Well, I, and I still remember the first day I sat in that front row. I mean, it, like I said, it really, I mean, it really was hard to do because in that day, most classes weren't full, like all desks weren't taken up. So nobody sat in the front row. <laughs> so I was the really oddball in some cases where I was the only person sitting in the front row, but I was determined to change. It's kind of like that one guy sitting in the front row of a Baptist church. Yeah, He's that's right. by himself. It's true. It's true. <laughs> But I'm telling you, it changed and it set the tone for everything else I did. Yeah. And it just, yeah, anybody who's struggling with anything, you know, the question is, what can you change? What can you do differently? You mentioned that you uh, you, you called me up and said, hey, I'm going to be doing this workout. Wouldn't be a bad idea if you showed up, could help me out a little bit. That held you. I mean, you didn't really want me to there to, to some degree. In the back of your mind, there's a voice going, you don't want that because he's going to force you to. <laughs> To run hard. I not only had you there, but I scheduled it to where I was going to be finishing when the whole track team showed up. That's right. And and I still failed on that particular occasion. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we got to do things. It's, it's sometimes we got to take a radical approach to 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 get into because everything in society says don't talk to God, don't read your Bible, don't don't spend time in prayer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we got to do radical things. I think was it Martin Luther you always talk about that says mm -hmm. I've got so much to do today yep. that I need to get up extra early to pray even more. Yep. And that's man, that's so true. And yeah, it's a, I don't know, it's a great story. It really hits home on a lot of levels. <laughs> Another thing I remember doing when I was young was I had to get up early to run every day before high school. Mm -hmm. Well, high school people don't get up early, mm -mm. right? I mean, it's like get up just at the last second you have to to get to, to school. Well, I would get up and run before. The only way that I would get up and run is if I took my alarm clock and set it all the way across the other side of the room, where in order to turn my alarm clock off, I had to get out of bed. He's going to kill me for saying this. And you know that, what Landon does? What does he do? He not only puts his alarm clock on the other side of the room, he puts it behind his dresser. <laughs> where he has to move his dresser to turn. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding that he'll kill me for saying that. That's great. But he, he's but been having a problem, so he's taking radical steps to change that. It's doing whatever it takes to make a change and making it where, and you know, eventually it got easier. Yeah. To get up and turn that alarm clock off yeah. because you got you you, you got in habit. Changed your habits. That's right. In effect. Yeah. So. Here's the question. How can you make sure you read that Bible every day? How can you make sure you spend time in prayer every day? How can you make sure to get those couch to marathon workouts in? It may take some pretty radical change. 
But if it does, it's worth it. You will take the necessary steps to get done what's important in your life. Yep. Now, if you say that having your quiet time is important to you, but you don't do it, says this is going to hurt, but it says that it's not that important to you. Yep. That's right. That's the bottom line. I mean, that's convicting when I say it. Yeah. Because there's days I struggle with getting it in, but it's just it's it's priorities. Is all it is. And then, uh, let me let me throw in this little caveat. There are times when you try that radical thing and it doesn't work, right? Yeah. That yeah. happens. I've tried a lot of radical things that didn't work. Yeah, you I know? failed in front of the whole track team the other day. Yeah, but if one out of four does work. It's totally worth it. You try something different. That's yeah. right. I That's didn't right. do the same thing the next time. That's right. I heard a story on a podcast we were doing, <laughs> and it and it changed. You, yeah, keep keep doing things until you find that right because you will find the right mix. Yeah. And but don't give stick up. with that. Don't give up. I'm so glad I didn't drop out of school when my <laughs> yeah. you know when they were about to kick me out. Yeah, you know I did something different. Think it, about where you could be now had yeah. you got kicked out of school. No telling where I'd be. Yeah. I have no idea. Wouldn't be here. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. While you're working hard to keep your body in shape physically, the music you listen to while you run can help keep you in shape spiritually. We've partnered with J Radio to put together a group of running playlists by Dean, Lane, Holly, myself, and others that you hear here on the Run For God podcast. Plus, you can listen to a playlist put together by members of Run Club just like you. Check out the whole station of Run For God playlist at jradio.com and in the J Radio app. Every week, I share a reason why running or walking is so awesome. And this is this week's. It's universal. Almost everyone can do it. Now, there are obviously a few people who can't run, but for the most part, almost everybody can run or walk. It's sort of like writing. You know, almost everybody can write. Mm -hmm. Some people do it well, and some people don't do it well. But even the people that don't do it well, some of them really enjoy doing it. Some people do it well, and some people have editors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's uh, it's just one of those things where everybody can do it. And so yeah. it, it just makes it so cool because because so many people can do it. Just like that lady I met in the bank, you know, she she's talking about wanting to do something. She can do it mm-hmm. if she wants to. And it's that's why one of the things I like about running or walking. Well, a couple of crazy things happened. Um, in a college track meet this past weekend in the ACC championships, the indoor championships, um, you know, when they have like, you know, in this case, I think in ACC, there's like 15 different schools. I don't know how many run indoor track, probably at least 12, mm-hmm. probably. And uh, so you, if you if you get a, a couple of people from each uh, school, then you got 25 people who are going to run the 5K, let's say. Well, 25 people is too many on an indoor track in particular. And so they have to split it into heats. Mm -hmm. So the way that they do it is they take the slower group. You're seated by whatever times you've run to get you to that point. And the slower group runs first. And then the faster group runs second. And, you know, what always happens is that second group, you know, that's where the the higher places go in. But theoretically, the people in the first heat, the slower heat, could place higher if they run faster Mm -hmm. than the people in the fast heat. It just never happens until this past weekend. What happened was the the slow heat ran really, really well. They actually ran under 14 minutes. Five of them ran under 14 minutes for 5K. And um, the, the fast heat, Nobody wanted to lead it. So it went out slow. It got tactical. And the winner ran 1401. Mm. And so the the top five in the ACC and the 5K this year were five guys who thought they had no chance of being in, in the top five. And it's kind of cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. unusual for sure. Um, so that's a, it's a lesson on doing your best no matter what, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then an even crazier thing happened. In the four by four hundred meter run, when Duke University was in, they were leading the meet, and all they had to do was finish sixth place or better in the four by four hundred meter um, relay. And so, 
And they were not only sixth, but they were battling for the win. They were actually leading it on the last leg of the 4 by 400 meter relay. And, of course, everybody at Duke is like, yeah, we're going to win the ACC championship, and it's all great, and it's all roses. And there was one team that was really close. And so, But even if they finished second, they were going to win the championship. But as the leader was trying, was running toward the finish line and about to finish, a girl from Florida State ran up beside her on her right side, which happened to be the side where she had the baton in. And when she pulled her arm back, the girl from Duke, she hit the arm of the girl from Florida State and it knocked the baton out of her hand. She was about six feet from the finish line when it mm-hmm. happened. And so the rule is you have, the baton has to cross the line with the runner. Mm-hmm. It didn't. And so they were disqualified, and they lost the ACC championship on. Oh, man. And what's so sad about that is, as a coach, I coach you know, track, and, and I tell folks, you don't want to grip that baton mm-hmm. too tightly. No. You, know, you just want to hold on to it just enough to hold it in your hand. And Conserve I'm sure that energy. That's what she was doing. Mm. And just by freak accident, it got knocked out of her hand. And the sad part is, as if it had happened anywhere else on the track, she would have, you know, she would have gone back, picked the baton up, and kept going, and she'd have been fine. She'd have still finished in the top six, but because it happened right at the finish line, it it, it freaked her out. She was across the line, and then the next team's. I She's think, probably across the line before she realized what happened. Yeah, and she had seven seconds to make a decision, get back, and and, and finish, and wow. she couldn't make the decision fast enough, and so yeah, and that that's crazy, right? Uh, but you know, I tell you what, though, I think that the. The thing that I would say about this is it doesn't matter. If you're out there and you're a recreational runner and you're just trying to get to the finish of a 5K, crazy stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Things come out of nowhere and make it hard. And we just have to roll with it. There's Mm -hmm. nothing they can do. Duke will be back next year. They'll try their best and you know that girl i'm sure she thinks about she probably can't sleep at night right now yeah, thinking I'm about sure. oh if i'd have just if i'd have been carrying that thing in my left hand if i had done if i had gripped it a little bit tighter all sorts of things but you can't do anything about it mm-hmm. you just got to focus on moving ahead so i remember one time i false started in a four by 800 meter relay in high school I still maintain today that i did not false start <laughs> that the guy next to me was the guy that started and i I did react to him. You reacted to him. And so I, I was the one that got called out, though. And in that time, it was if you fall started, you were out. Mm. So it took our whole team out of the 4 by 800 meter relay. We were probably going to win it. And um, I took us out of it. And um, I felt so bad. Yeah. I mean, my whole team. Of course, my team was re- very supportive. But it was just crazy. Uh, but anyway, you know, uh, crazy stuff happens. Uh, another example of that happened this weekend. Uh, that friend I was, I was talking about, Ryan Trum, he went down in that race. And the reason he went down was because there was a lady. Again, I mentioned that ages are on your back. There was a 70-year-old lady in front of him at the start. Mm. and They don't I'm, seed the star line some way? No. Man, they, you would they, think a race that big. They ask everybody to line up in order. And you would think that the group, a group like that, that are more elite runners, they would understand it, that it's important to line up in the right places. But I think for like age graded stuff, I think they measure you by gun time and not by net time. So the gun time means from when the gun goes off. Net time is from when you start to the, the, cross the mm-hmm. starting line. And so some people, that one or two seconds that they could lose by being, or five seconds if you're further back, um, could mean a lot to them. And so they want to get up as far in, into the front as they could. At one point, we were so packed in so tight before the race started. It was the most uncomfortable race start I've ever been in. I mean, yeah, I saw a video of the start of it. It was it was crazy. Literally, people were just like, I mean, I couldn't move my hands were beside were beside me. I couldn't move my hands at all because there was a woman standing beside me, and if I moved my hands, I was going to touch her in places I didn't need to touch her. Yeah. I mean, it was that it was so tight that I couldn't even pick my arm up and get it out. And the guy next to me, you could tell he was really worried about it, and so he was trying to make himself wide, yeah. his elbow in me. 
Um, but they asked us to take it to, to step back and make more room. And so I was trying to do that. Well, there was a lady behind me who had stuck her foot right behind me and she would not move her foot. <laughs> and I was like, I'm trying to back up. I'm trying to give people in front of me more space. So and and in turn, hopefully get me. She was not going to move. And <laughs> like you said, you had a. A start line of a bunch of type A's, and yes. they're going to do it their way. Yes. No matter what the, the announcer's saying. And unfortunately, that one lady that was in front of Ryan, as she went across the starting line, she wanted to make sure her watch started. So she held her arm up in front of her face <sighs> as she's crossing to make sure her watch started. Yeah. And that's what caused it. And um, he went down. He got back up. He finished. He was seventh in his age, in the same age group I run in. And so he ran really well. Yeah. But um, not as well as he did last year at that same race. But um, – Things happen. Things happen. Crazy you gotta, thing. Got to keep moving. But here's what I want to say about that at the beginning of a race. Please, please, please be smart about where you start a race because that's so dangerous. Yeah. That lady could have been trampled. Yeah. Um, fortunately, she wasn't, but it could have been so much worse. Usually the problem at most race, general race start lines is kids. Yeah. A lot they want to get up front yeah. and they're excited. And yeah, I've seen some, I've seen some. People yeah. go down because of that. Because yeah. number one, you got faster people behind them, and then number two, those faster people don't even see them. You know, yeah. they're focused down the road, and they yeah. got this five-year-old right in front of them. They trip over them, and well, and maybe the worst thing about kids is we know as adults that you want to run in a straight line yeah. when you when things are tight. <laughs> yeah. They don't. No. You know, they're back and forth, zigzagging and stuff yeah. like that, and they they so it's, it's really hard to pass them because yeah. of that but anyway just be careful at the start of races yeah. don't you know for most of us that net time is fine it's going to start your time when you cross the starting don't worry about that and everything will be fine so i hope they change the way they give out that i think that's why i think it was the age graded money there's money on the line and so i don't know i hope they change it hmm. but there was in this race a 98 year old woman that won the age graded competition wow. for women she she graded over a hundred percent which means she set a world record <laughs> and uh yeah she's 98 she ran 30 something minutes for for five that's incredible though. yeah 98 yeah. years old yeah yeah it was really cool i mean she's a hero to the running community yeah, sure you know it's just everybody that just admires her so much yeah uh, it's pretty cool all right well we have a trivia question for this week I'm talking about uh how fast we are let's let's have this one what is the fastest animal do you know the answer to that one do you think you know the answer to that? I think I know, but I have a feeling it's a trick because you like trick questions. You don't think I would trick anybody, do you? I think I do. What is the fastest animal? And if you know the answer to that or you've Googled it and you have found the answer to it, be the first one to send that to dean at runforgod.com and you will win um, some money off the Run For God store, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, you don't want to miss that. So answer that question, dean at runforgod.com. Now, sometimes sometimes I get answers really quick. I mean, the podcast comes out and like an hour later, I've got, I've got an answer. And then sometimes... It's a few days hmm. before somebody answers. So you never know. Yeah. So participate. All right. I'm going to leave you with this motivational thought of the week. It comes from George Sheehan, who wrote several running books. Right. And um, it says, it's very hard in the beginning to understand that the whole idea is not to beat the other runners. Eventually, you learn that the competition is against the little voice inside you that wants you to quit. That's so true. Isn't it? It is. Yep. You just experienced that recently. I did. Right? That voice got too loud. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it's not about how fast you are in comparison to others. It's about just keeping on going mm -hmm. and keeping one foot in front of the other. It's very simple, right? Sure. All right. Make sure you go out there and rate our podcast. Make sure you're sharing this with other people. Make sure you're sharing Run Club. Make sure people know about Run Club because we got something special here. You know that because you're a part of it, probably if you're listening to this. And if you are, and if you're not, if you're not a part of Run Club and you're just listening to this podcast, go check out, go to runforgod.com, check out um, the Run Club. It'll be the best decision you ever made. Yeah. And if you're out there and you know Rachel Cruz, Send this podcast to her. We love what she does. We love what the whole rant. We talk about Ramsey on here all the time. We would love to get her in this club and break out those 
pair of running shoes and get her to a half marathon. Wouldn't that be cool, Dean? That would be awesome. So if you know her, send it to her. That's right. All right, until next week, may God bless every step of every run and or walk. Go out there and shine your light. Good job, Dean. For more information about the Run for God ministry, go to runforgod.com. If you have questions about your salvation, click on the Peace with God tab. There's nothing more important. Thanks for joining us today.